Well, the statistics are shocking. Four out of every 10 women have been victims of intimate partner violence. And about 25% of all men have also been victimized by a partner. Now that suggests that 114 million of us are going to experience psychological aggression by an intimate partner sometime in our lifetime. And it can start in our teens. These assaults can even result in murder. So how do we begin to stop the violence before it starts? Welcome to Profiling Evil's Academy, Season 3, in this episode on intimate partner and family violence. Now, if you're one of the university students or my Profiling Evil channel members, welcome back and thanks so much for your support. Uh, please, everybody, take a moment and hit that like and subscribe button and ring the bell so you're getting all of our videos and you're notified when a new one is released. And if you don't mind, share us with your friends and your contacts. And keep in mind, you can find Profiling Evil on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And you can always check us out on ProfilingEvil.com. Now, intimate partner violence is not only criminal, but it's a serious public health problem that can impact and have a profound lifelong impact on our lives, our well-being, and frankly, opportunities. Intimate partner violence is abuse or aggression that occurs during romantic relationships. And the tag, intimate partner, refers to both current and former spouses and dating partners. And there are no measurements as to how often or how severe it is. It can range from one episode to repetitive, impactful, chronic events that last over a lifetime. Intimate partner violence includes any of the following behaviors. Things like physical violence, such as when a perpetrator hurts or tries to hurt a partner by hitting, kicking, or using some kind of other violent force. The violence can be sexual, like forcing a partner to do something they don't want to do. Stalking is another form of violence where, when repeated, an unwanted attention and contact causes fear or concern. It's stalking. That fear could be for their own safety or the safety of somebody who's close to the victim. Now, it's not always physical, though. Psychological aggression is the use of verbal and nonverbal communication with the intent to harm a partner mentally, emotionally, and frankly, to exert control over them. And if that's not enough, the abuse can lead to other serious health issues and economic concerns. So the good news, according to the experts, is that intimate partner violence can be prevented. You know, I've made this comment many times, and I, I don't have anything to back it up but my own experience, but I don't believe domestic violence will get better on its own. It's going to take real work and often professional help or separation from each other to have it get better. Intimate partner violence affects millions of people in the United States each year, and I suspect those numbers globally are not much different than what we're experiencing here. So we, we need to kind of consider the numbers as it relates to population numbers. In the United States, more than 61 million women and 53 million men have experienced psychological aggression by an intimate partner during their lifetime. In many cases, it begins in their teen years, and 24% of those people victimized reported that the first time they were victimized was before the age of 18. Uh, these numbers appear higher in groups of people who are somewhat marginalized as well. Victims of intimate partner violence are more prone to have low self-esteem, low education, and lower incomes. They also are more prone to have increased depression, increased anger, and hostility. They might even be abusing alcohol or have other dependency issues, and often they lack social problem-solving skills. Now, the list of challenges they may face grows beyond these things. They face things like antisocial personality traits, impulsiveness, 
emotional dependency and insecurity, inability to make friends or keep friends. They may have or project unhealthy family relationships or exert hostility toward companions. Without question, folks, intimate partner violence is a serious problem that has lasting and harmful effects on the individual, the family, and the community. But prevention is possible, and change is within reach. That's if healthy, respectful, nonviolent relationships are the goal, and they can be the norm once again in people's lives. The Center for Disease Control developed a powerful resource called Preventing Intimate Partner Violence Across the Lifespan. It goes on to say it's a technical package of programs, policies, and practices, and it gives government leaders and communities some really great resources to help prevent intimate partner violence, to support survivors, and to lessen the short and long-term harms created by this. The strategies and their approaches make good sense, and I thought I'd like to share a few of those with you. They're things that are pretty simple to do and hopefully can be part of what we do. Things like teaching safe and healthy relationship skills through social emotional learning programs. It can be for individuals or for couples. Another strategy is to engage influential adults and peers to serve as mentors. Those mentors need to be primarily for men and boys, including empowerment and education strategies for the bystander who witnesses this thing. This approach extends from individual into family-based programs. And you can learn more about these and other strategies and approaches offered through the CDC by visiting their website. I'm going to put the link down below, but here's the good news. Experts say that intimate partner violence is preventable and understanding the factors that increase or decrease the risk of violence is all within reach. In order to prevent partner violence, we've got to address the factors that put people at risk. Those same factors that promote healthy, respectful, and nonviolent relationships. Intimate partner violence is defined as physical violence sexual violence, stalking, and psychological aggression by a current or former intimate partner, and is preventable. Intimate partner violence threatens the well-being of millions of people and their families every single day. Intimate partners may include current or former spouses, boyfriends, girlfriends, dating partners, or sexual partners. Intimate partner violence can occur between heterosexual or same-sex couples. Some victims may suffer just one experience, while others endure violence that lasts for years. One in four women and one in nine men have experienced intimate partner violence in their lifetime. And one in 10 high school students have experienced physical teen dating violence, which is a form of intimate partner violence. Intimate partner violence consequences are widespread. It impacts physical and mental health. It results in billions of dollars in medical, mental health, and lost work productivity costs. But the good news is that intimate partner violence is preventable. We have strategies that can help you prevent this problem in your community. We can prevent intimate partner violence by teaching safe and healthy relationship skills, engaging influential adults, working to prevent violence starting in early childhood, creating protective environments, strengthening economic support for families, and supporting survivors to increase safety and lessen harms. And frankly, since we're on the topic, let's discuss the companion problem of domestic violence, also known as domestic abuse or family violence. These are violence events that occur in domestic settings, such as in the marriage or cohabitation such as in marriage or cohabitation, and it can be confused with intimate partner violence, but it really is its own classification because it also involves violence against children, parents, or the elderly. Now, domestic violence can assume multiple forms, including physical, verbal, emotional, economic, religious, productive, or even sexual abuse. And worldwide, the victims of domestic violence are overwhelmingly women. 
women tend to experience more domestic violence than men. It's just a fact. The World Health Organization estimates that one in three of all women are subject to domestic violence at some point in their life. And believe it, believe it or not, in some countries, domestic violence may be seen as justified or legally permitted, particularly in cases of actual or suspected infidelity on the part of the woman. Can you, can you believe that? Uh, research supports that there is a direct correlation between a country's level of gender equality and the rates of domestic violence that occur in those countries. So in other words, countries with less gender equality experience higher rates of domestic violence. Domestic violence is among the most underreported crime worldwide for both men and women. And in most cases, the abuse in a domestic violence situation, the abuser believes they're somehow entitled to do that or, or that it's acceptable and justified. S studies show that these behaviors will produce an intergenerational cycle of violence. And that cycle extends to the children and other family members who may feel that such violence is acceptable or condoned and, and many of these abusers don't even consider themselves abusers. In these abusive relationships, there's often a cycle of abuse during which the tensions rise and an act of violence is committed. It's followed by a period of reconciliation and calm. The victims might be trapped in domestic violence situations through isolation, power, control, traumatic bonding, this bonding to the abuser, cultural acceptance, lack of financial resources, fear, shame, or out of the effort to protect the children. And this is a tough one to ask, folks, but what are your thoughts on this? I want you to take a moment, go back and watch my videos with Dr. Romani and also with Dr. Jane Moncton-Smith, where we talk about domestic violence and domestic violence leading to homicide. So here's a tough question for you. Many of you have personally experienced domestic violence or intimate partner violence. If you can, what do you want to share about that? What are some of those experiences that you may have had where you were victimized yourself? And folks, let's be respectful of each other. There may even be people who were perpetrators of such violence. Really think through your comments before you make them and be compassionate with each other. I'm going to be reading your comments down below, and I hope you're enjoying Season 3 of Profiling Evil's Academy. We're discussing criminal behavior in deeper detail, and I hope that you're taking time to hit the like and subscribe button and ring in that bell. And don't forget, check us out on Profiling Evil Podcasts on your favorite podcast platform. Visit. And visit ProfilingEvil.com where you can sign up for the BOLO, our digital newsletter. And make sure you're going back and watching some of those other videos in the Academy series. Well, thanks for listening, and we'll see you soon at the next crime scene.